K Trial was recorded on Wednesday, the 19th of August, 2020. A very good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me on uh, Get Real Thursday's edition of our program. Uh, tomorrow, on the 20th of uh, August, the country's uh, new parliament is going to be summoned and we will see what exactly uh, the agenda of this country is going to be and how exactly we'll see the next five years roll out. Now, on Monday, we had a discussion uh, with my guest, Dr. Harindra uh, Vidanage, uh, with regard to what's happening around the world. We talked about uh, how things around the world post-COVID-19 could affect us and uh, how exactly, uh, what kind of changes we need to make in order to make sure that we stay ahead of this current situation. Because at the end of the day, the priority is Sri Lankans. Um, we have to be part of the global community. We have to help each other. But then again, we need to take care of our people as well. And President Gautabi Rajpaksa has made very clear that his agenda is going to be uh, Sri Lanka first, if I can use that word, um, you know, uh, and make sure that we get the best deal we can when dealing with all, uh, countries all around the world. So, um, I need to get uh, an idea, you need to get an idea exactly what is the uh, game plan? Uh, what is a game plan dealing with uh, the countries around the world? Because there's a new, new, new way of uh, dealing post-COVID uh, continuously kind of shambled all the, the, the playbook, I would say, in terms of diplomatic uh, situations. So the guest I have tonight uh, actually uh, have been here many times. First, he came uh, to tell us what's happening with regard to COVID-19. He came to uh, talk to us about the um, the success story of Wuhan uh, and how exactly we brought those people from uh, Wuhan, China and, and, and gave them a place here and we took care of our own people. Uh, later on, he came here to talk about the military, uh, his, his service in the military. And tonight he comes to me as Sri Lanka's new Secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Admiral Janath Kolomagay, welcome back and congratulations you. uh, on your new appointment. Um, I think uh, Thank the correct you. person got the job. Uh, so my question to you, the first question, and this is your first interview uh, after yes, actually uh, being appointed as the Foreign uh, Secretary um, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, you have a massive task ahead of you, uh, dealing with the the issues that is at hand. You're, you are coming in, the president is coming in, the government is coming in at a time where the entire world is suffering from a pandemic. This you know very well at the end of the day. So, what change ha has things changed from what you planned before the presidential election and right now um, is, is is new things being added or you'll have retracted certain things of president uh, Gotabe Rajpaksa's uh, foreign policy well Mahesh thank you very much once again for inviting me so this is as you mentioned the first interview yeah. I am giving so Derana is not a strange place. Other Derana have been here many times uh, sitting on the same chair yes. with you. Uh, I can't even remember how many programs <laughs> I have done. And I know they have good uh, got uh, good ratings as well because we have presented something the weavers they, they wanted True. to be educated. Um, so you uh, started the, uh, the session talking about COVID and the world. Uh, so if I may add a little there, because as a preamble to uh, yes. the answer to my question, um, you see, we were talking about a new world order. You know, we were talking about uh, a shifting of economic from yeah. the west to east, shifting of power from west to east when we were, we were expecting something to happen. We had trade war, we had 5G war, we had words of uh, war, many things going on. But then all of a sudden, COVID came. Now, COVID is the unfone, unforeseen enemy, uh, but I would say the most dangerous enemy. Now, we all know, I mean, how much it has impacted on the lives of people, how we do business, how do we deal with countries, how do we travel, all that, uh, it's a new dimension. So therefore, I like to say, a new world has emerged, but contrary to our expectation, in a totally a different way. Now, COVID, to us, I think, 
This is Sri Lanka is one of the best countries yeah. uh, which handle COVID so effectively. 100%. And to date, we have not allowed the COVID to be a community spread. You know, we have had few clusters, but we managed to uh, tackle it very effectively. And that's basically the direct supervision, decision taking and consultation carried out by the president, prime minister and a small team of uh, ministers, but mostly the officials. It was health the health, officials. the military, uh, other officials who actually perform their uh, tasks to the best of their... they are still doing it. They are still doing it, right? So this is part of the success story. Now, COVID also has given us a wake-up call yeah. because when COVID came, uh, our economy was nearly totally dependent on the imports. We mm -hmm. were bringing something and selling. We were bringing a container and transshipping. Too much. Too much. Way too much. I mean, we depended practically for every our needs. Even uh, to water. Even water. Even <laughs> a, a apple. Even an orange. You know, we had to bring everything from abroad. Now there were interruption to the global supply chain immediately because of the COVID, but we survived and that's it. That means we can survive, yeah. right? So that has actually given a very good wake up call to Sri Lanka to revisit our economic model. So that is why the president is very keen on shifting from an import dependent economy to somewhat as much as we can to an export dependent or export oriented economy. In that, one of the major pillars will be agriculture, right? So this is the new focus. Now our foreign policy should be shaped towards achieving that. We all know that the economy, I don't know whether it is a recession or not as of now, but all the economies are suffering. Now, Sri Lankan economy was not doing well before COVID. So it is, I mean, making... I think it's doing better than <laughs> now. So he was in a very bad shape at yeah. that time. So now we are having an even a more difficult situation because we were not doing very well. And all of a sudden, COVID came. You see, the tourism industry yeah. is near zero. Travel industry is suffering. The foreign remittance will be trickle down to a very low level. Now we have to rethink of our economy and also the COVID has given us fresh thinking. Now one example is, I think you mentioned some of the things, what is the role of the international community? Did many, did many countries support us? The answer mm. is no. Yes. Could many countries support us? Again, the answer is no, because they had to look after their own citizens. They had to look because after their COVID. own country, right? So that was a wake up call. Now imagine the situation, if we didn't have sufficient rice for that matter, right? At that particular moment, like coming to about February this year, we would have had a big trouble, right? So now this food security, that we have to produce what we need to eat has really set in. And similarly, the medicine security. We were not a medicine producing country. Everything came from abroad, but there is a huge awareness that we need to focus on these two things, food security and medicine security. That means we have to produce what we need, mm -hmm. right? So these two things are there. So we have to really look at, that's what I mentioned, the international community could not and did not help us. Even the international organization, they did provide their advice, but they couldn't really support us in a big way. So that means we have survived and that means we can do it. Right? So the question comes down to, uh, so far, I think for, I don't know, many, 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 many years, the the thinking always has been in Sri Lanka in terms of foreign policy is that we have to take whatever they give. The begging yeah. mentality has mm -hmm. been uh, in existence for quite some time. And it is, I think, even in that entire system, it's embedded uh, mm -hmm. with, with the way we're thinking. If the United States says something, here we go. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah we have to listen to that. And, you know, that kind of an attitude. Mm -hmm. How are you? Uh, the president doesn't have that. The president wants mm -hmm. to make Sri Lanka to stand shoulder to shoulder with every single country so we can deal. 
uh, in a fair and a diplomatic manner rather than you know bowing down and you know just letting them do whatever they want to do now a very good example is the MCC agreement mm -hmm. uh, earlier on they were very much ready to sign it uh, and, and there was so much of bad things within that agreement that would affect our sovereignty so now the president said no that we're not bowing down to 400 uh, I think 50 million dollars a uh, 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 cash ground so now how th that is your challenge at the end of the day mm -hmm. for the next five years you need to get a, a foreign service that would not bow down to foreign pressure and mm -hmm. actually have a diplomatic uh, uh, method of, of dealing with things how are you going to do that well uh, Mahesh I mean to begin with the question are we a small country right in size yes we are in population we are but look at the attention that this little country is getting right whether it is coming from USA India China Australia EU Japan we are the center of attraction right because of the geographical location the geostrategic value of this country so therefore I would argue we are a big power yeah. right we are a big country because uh, if you take the united states india mm -hmm. uh, russia uh, e even uh, china massively they want to be part of this country's uh, uh, politics politics uh, and and development and military defense so why is that because we are important so as you said we must never think that we are a small country yeah, yeah, island yeah. nation you know we have to depend on other countries no now president has clearly said no more loans we don't need loans right but what we need is as you said equal partners joint ventures built operate transfer foreign direct investment is, is not having loans is, is that set in stone by the president president is very strict on that it is very because you see the problem in Sri Lanka is our foreign I mean debt to our mm. external debt to GDP ratio is as high as 86 percent that means if we earn 100 dollars we have yes, to repay or we have to pay 86 dollars that's a very high figure so we cannot afford to take any more loans but then value what we have the location that should be our marketing strategy value what we have and make money from it from the location from the shipping from the ocean right so that is why the president is very keen and said no more loans but we are open for joint ventures yeah built operate transfer models and foreign direct investment but qualifying that saying total control of any national strategic assets will not be given to a foreign what power. does that mean okay what does it mean that let's take for example Hambantota port now Hambantota port we have given to China merchant port holding for a total period of 99 years now in that deal roughly uh, you know people have different uh, ideas but it's about 85 percent of that project stakes are for the china sure. merchant port holding and only 15 percent for sri lanka now yes we have our control we will do everything so that nobody will use our country against another country but then giving total control for a long period or majority 85 percent is a very high stake so what does it mean that means in, in in the future any project we will have 51 percent minimum the balance 49 can be divided by various stakeholders who bring the money i want to uh, get to the fact uh, that whether will that work would that actually uh, attract investors uh, but before that let's take a short commercial break I'm in conversation with the new uh, secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Admiral Janath Kolumbia. We'll be right back. You're watching it. Welcome back everyone.
want to get real. I'm in conversation with uh, the Secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Admiral Janav Kolumbage. Uh, before the break, we were talking about the fact that, you know, 51% uh, uh, to 49%, that's going to be the new trend when uh, a any company, any government coming in to invest here in Sri Lanka uh, for a longer period of time, 99 years, we're not going to be, you know, like the Hamant report, 80% uh, and, and, and 15% uh, percent of, um, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Now, that's a challenge because at the mm -hmm. end of the day, if you're going to pitch this to foreign investors and they say, okay, 49% means that you can kick us out at any time you want, how, how exactly uh, are you going to ensure their confidence in, you know, bringing them here and telling Sri Lanka is a viable place for investment? Well, uh, Mahesh, we cannot kick anyone out just like that, although we have 51% because these are international agreements, right? When we enter into a business uh, venture, so that will be an internationally binding agreement as a government, we are bound to honor it. And also there will be arbitration clauses. I mean, should the, some party yeah. break, then there will be huge penalties to be Paid if you know unilaterally we say get out it doesn't mean that what it means is actually control I mean total control of that asset in strategic sense right not necessarily the commercial sense commercial sense of course it's a 51 49 that is the arrangement but then how we share the profit will depend on how much money they bring in mm. so that's a separate but then strategically I mean when we want to make a decision regarding a particular country trying to use yeah. a facility in Sri Lanka against another country, you know, that is a crucial decision we have to make. So that is what I meant yes. by 51%. That means we have legally, we, we have the legally the power to not to subject. This is not happening at the Hambantar report? Well, we are trying our best to recorrect what the mistake we have done. Yes, we, it can happen because it's we don't we we uh, we say the navy is in charge of uh, security and nothing can happen without our authority. But then, you see, over a long period of time, giving that much yeah, yeah. control may not be the best option. This government will be here uh, next five years, ten years. We don't know. But then things will continue. Ninety-nine year years is a very long time and that money is not exactly coming back to Sri Lanka not really yeah they will earn the money so here I think what we need is to add value to what we already have the land the ocean the location and I think positive signs there are many people who already talk and say we are interested in investing in Sri Lanka. Can we come? And we said, okay, we will bring this you. This is in. happening for real. It's happening for real because they, I think the potential of Sri Lanka is real. Uh, and we need to direct our foreign policy towards that. So this brings me to the point that uh, you mentioned even before the interview, the president's policy of neutrality. So he wished to remain neutral. Would that work? Now, uh, you said that there are many countries. Let's take uh, the United States has a very uh, crucial interest here within this region. India, at the end of the day, uh, I think you by yourself have told many times that we are not going to omit India in any way. No way. Uh, yeah. This thing, China is a big player in Sri Lanka as well. But if you take all these countries, they are fighting among themselves mm -hmm. as well. Uh, that's a different fight. Now, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, if you take China, if China takes makes a decision, let's uh, hypothetically think about Hong Kong, they do expect their friends to react. So how are we going to, you know, walk, walk this thin line of, you know, we are neutral, we are still your friend. How exactly? It's, it's a challenge and I would like to know uh, your take on that. Well, it is a challenge, but uh, we are meant to fight challenges and overcome the challenges. Hong Kong is a very different uh, uh, situation. It's, I mean, it's, it was originally part of China, but because of the opium war, uh, very yeah. unethically, I would say, uh, another country took over it and ran for 99 year lease. Now they have this one country, two system, yeah. and uh, China is not very happy about it. So it's a different situation. So here, the situation can be compared to a soccer field. So many people or many countries want to make Sri Lanka that soccer yeah. field. They want to come and play the game here. 
Now we don't want to be the soccer field. Either we should be in the team or we should be the referee or at least the line referee. <laughs> it's a difficult thing, right? When two big, yeah. I mean many major powers are fighting. So that is what is needed. Now, if I ask you a question contrary to what you ask me, can the neutrality work? Can, if I ask, can the non-neutrality work for us? That means, mm -hmm. can we go with one? That will be detrimental to our progress. That will be suicidal. Say, for example, we, tra we select country A and we go fully with country A saying, okay, we are an ally of you militarily. We are with you. That is detrimental to us, right? So it's a very difficult but can be done. Right, we have to remain neutral. We have, so according to what you just said, we have a very good opportunity here. At the end of the day, uh, to invite everybody, we can actually play Geneva's role in yeah. terms of mediating and can, you know allowing everybody to come here and uh, for us to be neutral. Now, um, how exactly would you all, well, what kind of steps would you be taking? Because at the end of the day, I know United States uh, is very much pressuring for the MCC agreement. Uh, India wants to uh, you know take a stake uh, on. Uh, in a Colombo port and that that entire crisis is still uh, going on. China is very much influential in the um, Hamantara port. Then again, the, the port city is coming. So that mm -hmm. is another venture that, that needs investments as well. So how exactly will President Gotabe Rajapaksa and uh, uh, the ministry of yours, uh, along with Minister Dinesh Gunawardana, the foreign minister, and you all uh, do this because it's going to be a massive challenge in order to satisfy all and being neutral you need to satisfy all well uh, on the other side we don't have to satisfy anyone also <laughs> being neutral i mean you are neutral and you don't have to satisfy anyone i mean like when actually we are right now in the process of uh, drafting or finalizing a 20 point foreign policy directives so number one is actually the neutrality with that comes that we want to maintain friendly relations with everybody and then not giving national assets to uh, the uh, another country and not to allow Allow our country to be used against another yeah. country and then we have very categorically president has stated that we have a security wise strategic security wise India first policy because we cannot be we should not be we can't afford to be a strategic security threat for India period we can't be and we don't have to be so they are very big power fastest developing major economy in 2018 1.34 billion people 7,500 coastline is a huge country. We need to benefit from India. So that's there, right? So we don't have to make everyone happy. We have to make us happy. Indeed. Right? Not others happy. Think about you, right? Let them fight their war <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> Not here. But then we have to, now even to India, we have, I think very firmly, President has said, you are my first priority in so far as security is concerned, but I have to deal with other players for my economic prosperity. You see, if you take a president's uh, three pillars of his policy, number one is national security. Yes. Number two is economic development. Number three is foreign policy. So that much importance he gives to foreign policy. So he has told to Indian counterpart, everybody, yes, for security, we will never do anything harmful to you. But for economic yeah. purposes, we have to be open. Then you mentioned about port city. Now port city, we will... Let me uh, yeah. get uh, to that uh, a little later on. Uh, I want to take a short commercial break. Uh, you're watching it real. I'm in conversation with the new uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, Admiral Janath Kalamagiri Bhuvan.
on to get real. I'm in conversation with the new secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Admiral Janath Kulambike. Uh, we've been talking about exactly how the new foreign policy of President Gotabe Rajpaksa will shape up and how would that would play out practically in terms of post-COVID. Now, um, Admiral, one of the things that uh, we need to understand and which we have not, uh, I've spoke about this on Monday show, is the fact that uh, every single foreign policy that has been designed has omitted this particular factor, which is, which I mean, honestly, it was not there, uh, you know, five years, ten years ago. But now it's very active and very influential of a diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, because every single time when we talk about the diaspora in the past, it's a, a, a about LTT sympathizers mm -hmm. or, you know, something to do with the war and who is against us. But this particular diaspora uh, scattered all around the world, from Australia to the United States, it, there's a high amount of population which is very allegiant to this country, who wants to see this country grow, who wants to see this country prosper, and that they want the same facilities that they have in their countries to be here as well. If you take Australia, South Korea, Japan, even in Russia, uh, the Middle East, a huge, huge income earner for us. Uh, and, and, and the thinking has always been in terms of foreign policy, oh, they need to send us money. That, mm -hmm. that, that's what it is. But they are influential. They can do things. They can do things on our behalf in those particular countries. How are you as a new secretary to uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs is going to harness that? Yeah, you are right, Mahesh. I mean, when we say diaspora, it is basically any Sri Lankan yes. who is living uh, abroad, not necessarily a particular community or a segment of that community. So we get really carried away uh, labeling the diaspora yeah. as negative. That's not the case. Um, then second point is the COVID actually has given a new value, or yes. new value to Sri Lanka for Sri Lankans living abroad. Yes, that, that has given a huge They're very value. Very proud about the fact yeah, that how right? things and are here. That is why many more people want to come back. Uh, some of them. Another thing is, of course, many have lost their jobs, lost lost their education opportunities, so they want to come back as well. Now, diaspora does not mean that they send remittance or yeah. the money. They can bring expertise. They can bring influence in those countries. Now, one, one case in point is now in, in Canada, when Ontario local assembly uh, passed a resolution uh, to declare a genocide week. Uh, this we discussed last yeah, week as well. It's a yeah. genocide week. Actually, the members of the Sri Lankan community came up and they even filed a case against it. Now, they're campaigning against it. They want the, you know, the natural justice. They want the Canadian parliamentarians to hear both sides. Right, and the Sri Lankans are Tamil, Sinhalese, Muslims. Yeah, I think it's a combination of everybody. Everything. It's not necessarily a Sinhala a group who's doing. So that means they have a love for their own country. Now, this diaspora, which is negative, I think it's it's a very small segment of that. So we should not focus only on that and forget the bigger picture. Now they are influential in their countries. They can lobby on behalf yeah. of Sri Lanka to remove this unnecessarily pointing finger at us, right? Whether it's, I mean, the, the, through this human right violation, we have not done anything, but then it's not fair yes. to point a finger at us, right? So that, therefore, the diaspora community should be a great focus in our new foreign policy and our foreign missions, whether it is a high commission or a diplomatic mission, ambassador, we really, they have to really work, right? They might also feel when you say, when you are serving in another country, this diaspora is bad, this diaspora is good. No, it's not like that. Everyone is diaspora. Everyone who has a link to Sri Lankan is, uh, are, should be considered as a diaspora. So they have a huge task, right? Now, I mean, we really did not measure the efficiency, efficacy of the deliverables of our missions. Yeah. But now we have to do it. We have to ask the hard questions. What are these hard questions? How much money have you spent in a particular year for housing, traveling, medical wages? It's not a vacation. It's not a vacation. And then on the other side of the scale is 
how many scholarships you have given to this country how many tourists have you arranged to come here how many foreign direct investment you have sent to this country these are the hard questions we have to ask of course then if you have any suggestion to improve what are they and whether you have excess staff or lack, lack of staff what can we do so these are the hard questions we are asking now the some of the things that i've heard uh, in traveling to like places like australia or or in uh, the uk or even in the states is the fact that when you speak to the sri lankan community there what they say is there is a massive uh, 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 separation between the the diplomatic mission of sri lanka and the community uh, most of the time what happens is they arrange certain things they do it in a, in their personal level but it is not done through the diplomatic channels like even if it be bringing in businesses from those countries uh, to sri lanka there is a lack of support from these missions so i'm mean, like to take a good example is the fact that uh, when you were repatriating flights uh, from various parts of the world uh, some don't get into these flights and even if they go through all that process of you know even speak to the sri lankan embassy not exactly you know useful because at the end of the day if they don't get a positive response they're not okay with it so how are we going to change this because we need to gain their support we need to get more um investments into our country and we need to be like con con continuously looking towards ways we can actually benefit from all this Th is that something that you all have been thinking or is that something is still in the back burner no no it is pretty much in the forerunner right now i mean to be fair with the missions i think covid is a very unusual situation mahesh i mean we had unprecedented number having grievances unprecedented number wanting to come back so our missions were not geared to handle that much number but i believe because i was really dealing with this yes. for the last 5 months i really received lot of support from our missions abroad they prepared the list and they prepared everything for the flight a pcr testing so i really want to defend them they have done what they could do well could they have done better well it's always room for improvement that's uh, there is no two words about it now uh, mahesh i will uh, answer your question in another way now during the last 8 months one thing i saw in colombo is every diplomat serving in colombo think like a business person every diplomat they want to talk about business they want to talk i mean of course they talk many other things but business is one of the top priority agenda every time they want to talk to president about a business opportunity talk to dr p b jayasundra about a business uh, uh, opportunity now have we been doing Didn't that say. i think the answer is no well some of them may have <clears throat> that is why the president is very cleanly i mean very uh, stringently assessing who should go as ambassador to which country because he has this business attitude in mind right so with that in mind only he is appointing the new ambassadors so that they should be having a business man attitude to bring in the investment tourism is one of the biggest sectors yeah. uh, that the foreign ministry needs to get involved in in, in order to make sure that you know we uh, our uh, industry here comes out from this crisis because it it got hammered every single time there's a bomb yeah. explosion it it got hammered and then on top of it the april 21st uh, easter, easter sunday attacks um, again it went down and then covid came and now it has kind of washed it completely over now uh, reviving that um the the airport industry the the airline industry all this needs to come together there is still a, a lack of initiative uh, i i don't want to say this but a lack of cooperation between the ministry the tourism ministry the foreign affairs ministry all these ministries were working in silos at this uh, up until now are you all looking at you know combining all this and actually coming together because covid taught you all all these ministries coming together and working absolutely resulted mm. in a positive trend um, how exactly no, no, are you i mean this? you are spot on i mean covid has really given us a lot of good lessons or the best practices and it was one team there was the ministry of health ministry of defense tourism aviation 
uh, everyone work as one team and that is the reason for the success that we have. So in future, we have to translate that success story into our activities because if we continue to work in our silos, we call it watertight compartment yeah. only for you. And if we have this I, me and my syndrome, rather than thinking of us, us or we, we are not going to succeed. Now, one thing is, now I think we are in a stage, we have a golden opportunity yeah. to make course corrections to our country and speed corrections as well. We must, we should know where we want to go and do everything to get there. If we miss this opportunity, I don't know when the next opportunity is going to come. So we should be determined to use this opportunity which the COVID has given, which the COVID has given in the way, in way of best practices, lessons learned. How do we translate this into working together as one to achieve a common objective? Now, I mean, I have seen, I have heard many different ministries have their own different mission and vision. Yeah. That should not be the case. <laughs> it should be right? one. It should be one. Yeah. Right? It should be one. So that is why yes, even should be the president's vision. Yeah, it is the vision, the country first approach. Because if I think my ministry is the most important mm -hmm. ministry and I should prevail my vision, I'm wrong. I should prevail the vision of the country. The vision of the country means the president, the government, the prime minister, that's the vision. I mean they are we are a democratic country. We have an elected president, we have elected government, they are our representatives. That should be our vision. So I always believe in that vision or the objective is one. But then how we do about it, I mean go about it and doing it is different. But as long as you have one common objective, we can work together. One of the other biggest challenges you're going to face uh, is going to be uh, at the UN Human Rights Council, um, convincing certain countries who have been very adversary towards us, uh, telling them, you know, th um, they, they, they never believed on the fact that when uh, President uh, Mahindra Rajpaksa in his administration, when he said, we will go ahead and select an internal solution to problems of our own, uh, they did not listen to it because they were continuously um, promoting the fact that we are people who actually, you know, pretty much give bad, um, you know, make things worse for our Tamil community. We are not giving them the same rights as uh, everyone else, uh, which is a complete lie. Um, now you have another challenge there, uh, mm -hmm. going to Geneva, going into all these areas, but it's not exactly a challenge because you've been there defending the country uh, mm -hmm. all throughout Already. the uh, military <laughs> career. So, so uh, how exactly uh, these conversations are going to be a very bit, uh, a bit trickier than uh, before because uh, uh, earlier on it was like, okay, tell us what to do, but, but no, not longer, anymore. no longer it's the case. So uh, please tell well, me um, what exactly is your take on that? Well, it's a huge challenge. Challenge, but I think as far as the president is concerned, Geneva is not the only thing that we should focus on. We should not be focusing on defending ourselves too much. Yeah. I mean, people threaten saying, okay, there'll be an inquiry, there'll be economic sanction. Okay, let it come. We will face it at that time. But if we focus purely on that, and do everything to satisfy that, I think we lose focus. That's what they did the uh, last uh, four to five years. Yeah, so we lose focus. We lose focus about our country because we are focusing on a, another supranational agency to defend ourselves. So the president is not onto that, right? Now, today, this morning, when we were during a discussion, uh, uh, you know, uh, with uh, some foreign delegates, this discussion about, you know, what we should call it, peace building, Reconciliation, I said none. Let's talk about economic development. Don't talk about peace building, we are a peaceful nation. Don't talk about reconciliation, we can reconcile ourselves. And I told them, forceful reconciliation has not worked, <laughs> True. right? And you cannot achieve reconciliation by having a, 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 a air conditioned nice office in Colombo and coming out with concepts, coming out with brochures, uh, giving television shows, you can't have reconciliation. 
Reconciliation has to come from the community. And in my uh, personal view, it has happened to a, a, a great, great extent, extent because if you go to the community yes. where Tamil uh, people yeah. live, Sinhalese people live, Muslim people live, they mm. don't want all these nonsense nope. uh, uh, spoken by the, the politicians nope. Uh, nope. who are keeping this entire, uh, um, you know, thing. Lots of good words coming into my mouth and I yeah. can't use it on air. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that kind of process. So um, it's good that the president is thinking on that uh, economic perspective and putting that yeah. uh, uh, forward. But then again, uh, one of the things that happened during uh, President uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa's administration is the fact that, uh, and the opposition is now fueling that particular ideology, is the fact that apparently Sri Lanka got isolated. Sri Lanka didn't have friends. Uh, during that time, we had uh, kings and queens from unknown countries coming as foreign dignitaries, visiting, uh, uh, having state visits. And uh, President uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa didn't even get those kind of uh, response from countries like the United Kingdom, the United States. They were very adversarial to, to, to the um, government of uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksa. Now, the opposition is fueling this particular sentiment once again, saying that President Gautabi Rajapaksa's action thus far and what he's intending to do in the future is going to bring that isolation back. Um, how do you respond? Well, uh, I don't think that will happen because what I saw during the last nine months is quite contrary. What I saw is that everybody wants to come here. I mean, of course, during the COVID, we couldn't travel. Everybody wants to, to have uh, at least a video conference with the president. And every ambassador, every head of the mission here in Sri Lanka, every international organization here in Sri Lanka come to meet the president, us, and they say we have to work together, right? So I see a very different picture because I was there. And I see there is a renewed interest in Sri Lanka. There is a renewal. Now, again, let me ask you a question. Okay, there was a period, a lot of foreign dignitaries did come to Sri Lanka. What have we got? Mm. Has they, <laughs> have they really uh, uh, changed our economy? Have they really brought about reconciliation? Have they really brought about our development? The answer, I'll leave it up to you. So, it doesn't mean that just because uh, we are friends. Friends, uh, somebody yeah. come, it doesn't mean much. But I have a feeling the moment the COVID restrictions are lifted, scores of foreign heads are going to come here and the president and the prime minister and our, our team will be invited to those countries as well. Right? So that is a very good sign. We will not be isolated. That is why, I mean, I think you brought this uh, point. Now, reconciliation, in my personal experience is whether you are a Tamil, Sinhala, mm. Muslim or a burger, your requirements are very common and very Equal basic. Opportunities. You have, you need a house, you need education for your children, you need a job to earn your living or a business and you need to have a good health system and you need to feel secure that you are not being persecuted because you belong yeah. to an ethnic community or whether you belong to a particular religion. These are the five basic requirements of all people in Sri Lanka. And president is determined to address that, right? So that is why in the morning I said, don't talk about peace building, don't talk about re rehabilitation. Let's talk about economic development because Everybody. economic development encompasses a wide range of things. It goes to the livelihood of the person, right? The, 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 the person. So economic development is what we need, nothing else. But I think we will be getting many friends to come. Let's take a short commercial break. Uh, I have some more uh, things to ask from the new uh, secretary uh, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You're watching Gatriel and I'm in conversation with Admiral Jana Kumgiri. want to get real I'm in conversation with the new secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Admiral Jainath Kolumbage uh, we are running out of time Admiral uh, one final question uh, one of the biggest things that everybody's uh, 
asking is the fact that, you know, I, I know you're not directly involved in it, but still, I would like to get a response. Uh, when will the airport <laughs> be open and when will we be able to fly uh, around the world or, you know, mm -hmm. travel? Well, I mean, the answer is yes, our airspace is closed officially. But during the past three, four months, we have brought in nearly 24,000 yeah. Sri Lankans. That responsibility back. is still with you, right? Well, for the time for the being, <laughs> until I hand it over to uh, someone nominated by the president, he told me to uh, undertake it uh, for the time being. And that is from 95 different countries. So that's a huge achievement. And right now, after the election uh, was over, we have really expedited that intake and we are now bringing at least one flight to Bandarnak International Airport and another flight to Mattala. So we have really increased the tempo of bringing Why? people. Because there are a lot of people waiting to come. Still. Still, there are a lot of people still waiting to come to Sri Lanka. People who have lost their jobs, people who have finished their education, people who had gone on short-term temporary visa. And this uh, uh, people who come still goes through the 14-day quarantine yes, period, the whole process is still there. Yes, that's there. We do a PCR test on arrival. We don't 100% trust any other PCR done elsewhere because we have a lot of experiences. Yeah. They come with a negative PCR, but when we test them here, they become positive. positive. So we do a PCR Miraculously test. Miraculously, they become positive. Miraculously yeah. or otherwise. <laughs> so we do a test and we send them through the for, uh, quarantine. And even after 10 days, we sometimes get positive cases. That means if they had gone to the society, yeah. we would have got another cluster. So we are doing that. So the opening of the airport, I think the Airport Aviation Authority, Tourist Ministry, uh, Civil Aviation Department, Health Ministry, Army, we are talking about it, but we have not really had a long meeting uh, regarding this. Uh, but the preparations are going on. One preparation is we are setting up a lab inside the airport Right, so that you can check, uh, you can test at least 1,000 people per day with very modern machinery. It is supposed to come tomorrow with robotics and magnetic extraction, yeah, all that it's going to come. And also, uh, uh, airport authority is trying to develop a building closer to the airport to hold at least 1,000 people until the PCR test report is delivered to them before they are taken to a quarantine center. So this preparation is going on. But Mahesh, the problem is the opening of our airport will not determine, not necessarily on the situation in Sri Lanka. Yeah. It depends on the incidence of the virus in other countries as well, right? Because you know, can, yes. if we open, how can we get uh, so many people from a high-risk country? That would be endangering our own people. But having said that, there is a new concept called air bubble, yeah. right? You have a one destination coming here. So we create a bubble, we test them. There was a report saying that the Indian uh, High Commissioner is uh, talking about an air bubble like that with India and Sri Lanka, but India is a very high-risk country. Well, Are you yes. risking that? Well, not only Indian High Commissioner, many other, a few other countries have expressed the desire uh, because we are a hub as far as aviation is concerned in South Asia. We are already a hub, so they have a convenient gateway to other countries. So we have to see how best we can make that happen. That means minimum risk or no risk to our community, people come with a negative PCR uh, report and they go through their business in a bubble in an isolated area they finish the business and go back what is the request uh, like from which industries are they requesting to come to Sri Lanka well I think business people they want to come because they want to meet people and discuss and see the thing uh, but even now even without an air bubble large number of foreigners are coming to Sri Lanka people who are working in diplomatic mission, people who are working in international organization, that's one category, but large number of people who are working in our projects are coming as well. Whether it is from China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Europe, because you know, they are experts in those fields, so their service is needed. Sometimes we have installed the machinery, now we need to yeah. fine tune it, but we need to get an expert. So these people are coming. And there is a considerable number of people leaving the country as well. Well, not as high as normal time, a limited number of people are going, because you see still, these travel restrictions are there, 
in other countries you know you can't just walk out of the airport and go to wherever you want to go yeah. maybe you have to undergo a quarantine not necessarily in a designated center but in your house right so it's not easy, easy to travel still uh, but then a lot of people are coming to sri lanka despite uh, the travel restrictions uh, airport opening we have to find a date but it all depends on many variable factors but uh, we will come to i think having a discussion the president will determine when we can actually set a target date yeah. for opening our airport at least for limited uh, group of tourists to come uh, people to come freely in a safe and secure manner uh foreign secretary finally um what is your take for the next five years in terms of global relations uh, sri lanka and the rest of the world uh, it's not going to be like uh, we've been discussing uh, it's not going to be like business as usual um, no longer will we be falling and uh, begging and uh, be at the uh, pleasing of all these nations who've been using us as 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 some kind of uh, you know um again i don't want to use these words but uh you know that kind of an attitude so uh, a complete uh, mentality uh thinking has to change uh, how, what is your take what do you think uh, can we achieve that well i think we can because we are determined to achieve that and i think uh, president i once i remember he was telling that during the next 5 years we have to do the work of 15 years that yes. is the 5 years gone by and plan for the next 5 years so that means we have to really work and i think you know president is a taskmaster yes, he course. he believes in deliverables right so not that he give position and he would expect results and if results are not coming i don't think he will hesitate to change anyone i don't think any of any of us are indispensable no you know we have come for a purpose we are given a task we have to do it so if we don't do it we have to either leave or kicked out <laughs> as simple <laughs> as that but Hope. then we are hopeful because now we have a focus we know where we want to be and we know the path that we should take and we are determined to make it happen All right uh, Admiral Janath Kolamage thank you very much uh, for coming uh, and talking to us uh, the first interview you've given as the ministry to the, uh, as the secretary to the ministry of foreign affairs well that's it uh, for uh, this Thursday night's uh, program I'll be back again at 1:35 with World News see you then bye